W with comp, that means with compression, meaning they're pushing down on it, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm pushing down on it, it's the veins are they're they're elastic, right? They're mm -hmm. supposed to close. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these veins don't close when you have a blood clot in them. So you see it pushing down, she pushed down, oh she whoever mm -hmm. did this pushed down and the, the blood clot is still there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can dislodge a blood clot by pushing down on it. Sometimes we can push down on the blood clot, boom, that blood clot start moving and traveling down the bloodstream, eventually ending up in the lungs. That's how most, especially you could be doing legs. And a lot of times the, those, um, those blood clots will travel back to the lungs. Mm -hmm. So you can, sometimes you can be the cause of a, um, of a pulmonary embolism. But they're very serious, guys. When somebody has a PE, that's just as serious as doing a, um, doing a, a, a woman that has a threatened um, ectopic pregnancy. Okay, just as important, a, a, a PE, okay? That's why we do a lot of lower extremity Doppler exams because we're looking for blood clots. And so as we push down on different parts of the leg, arm, whatever the peripheral vessels we're looking at, there's a susceptibility that you can dislodge one of the blood clots, which is why we don't do a, um, what's called a, um, It is called a, boy, I haven't done an ultrasound in so long. Um, it's kind of like, we do it, it's called like a reflux study. I would like, say if I'm doing a leg, I would squeeze the calf to make sure the blood doesn't go backwards or it's not retrograde flow. So if you have somebody with a, um, with a blood clot and you notice it like this, that's a evident blood clot. Can't miss that, right? You won't, you won't do that reflux study um, on that patient. I don't know why that leaves me right now. The proper term for that, for that, I don't know what's going on. Huh? Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I heard that, that slick comment too. I ain't that old. <laughs> uh, now you say you don't do the uh, the reflux on a patient with a PE. Correct. You won't perform that compression. Correct. It's definitely won't won't do that. Golly, why can't I do that? <laughs> It's supposed to come to me by now. It's supposed to come to me by now. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, guys, let's keep going. Let's keep going. It's gonna come to me at the end. I'm gonna be on. I'm gonna be all on your um, remind app. Hey guys. <laughs> so look for me later on. All right. So so risk factors of a pulmonary embolus, guys. Again, the mo it's it's common to come from the the veins in the leg all the way back up front through the heart all the way to the lungs because we know eventually that blood is gonna go back to the lungs to get oxygenated, right? So that's how it ends up all the way in the lungs. So it comes up, the IVC, the SVC meet in the, to, at the right atrium. Right atrium, the blood goes to the right ventricle. Then it's the pulmonary vein is gonna take that blood to the lungs, okay? That blood's gonna get oxygenated, come back through the pulmonary uh, arteries, come back to the left, left atrium, atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary arteries out the arch. Got it. Okay. I was getting some quick flow. Okay. No worries, you don't have to know that. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's the reflex? Reflex. I told you I can't remember the name. <laughs> no, what's that? The, the, uh, Gastrological reflex. The who? Gastrological reflex. No, no. It's, a, it's, it's not called that. I'm, I'm using a simple term for reflux. It's not really, it's, it's what you're doing, but it's not. When I get it, I'll give it. When I, I mean, what you do? And you, you squeeze the person's calf. You nah. might squeeze. So if they have a, a study in their arm, I'll squeeze their forearm. I'll squeeze their forearm real quick. Huh. But we don't do that. Mm. Leave me alone, this I can't remember. <laughs> I keep thinking about it. I'm gonna keep moving, guys. Yeah. So, so risk risk factors of a PE include being older, living a sedentary lifestyle. Everybody know what a sedentary lifestyle? Being lazy, mm -hmm. not doing anything. You know. Uh, prolonged immobilization. Again, we were talking about yesterday, being on a plane for a long time, you're immobilized, you're highly susceptible to developing a blood clot. Okay? Recent trauma, <laughs> all right, uh, pregnancy, being in a hypercoagulable condition, just being more susceptible to developing blood clots. Say, for instance, you know, um, if you have really viscous blood or really thick blood, you're more susceptible to developing blood clots than somebody who has thin blood. They're more susceptible to bleeding out. Right, because their blood is so thin. Someone with really viscous blood, meaning their blood is gonna clot really fast, they're more susceptible to developing blood clots or developing a PE, okay? Estrogen use, 
recent hip or abdominal surgery, and of course, a previous DVT, which is a deep, deep vein thrombosis, which is what we call it in the, the veins in the legs. Deep vein thrombosis, that's what a DVT is, okay? Okay, that's a PE, very important. All these medical situations are very, very important according to us, and they can all happen to each and every one of you guys. Okay. So let's talk about a uh, cerebrovascular accident or a stroke, guys. CBA. A cerebral hmm? It's CBA, right? CBA, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Know, the, know that initial. Know those are uh, the acronym. A CBA is a result of an obstruction or occlusion of a cerebral artery within the brain, resulting in hemorrhage. Okay, here's, here's your blood vessels within the brain right here. This is the posterior part of the brain. It's the anterior part of the brain. These vessels lie in the inferior part of the brain, okay? This is called the circle of Lewis. This is the circle of Lewis. Remember I told you that even though one of these may get blocked, there's usually many tributaries that the blood can still go around and get through. You know, your body's so amazing that it'll create a new vessel for itself if it happens to get blocked off. Unfortunately, with the with the brain vessels, these vessels are so tiny that if, if it gets blocked off, and you it, it can result in a hemorrhage. So these vessels are really really tiny. So we, what we'll do on this study, we we'll do like a carotid artery exam. We can't see these little vessels in the brain. We cannot. We can't do an ultrasound on those. We can do continuous wave. We can do a continuous wave ultrasound on those just to get the blood flow but you really have to know where your vessels are, but we can't visualize through the skull, right? So there's no way we can see these blood vessels right here, okay? Strokes are often spontaneous events that range in severity, okay? Sometimes you can have a mild stroke known as a transient ischemic attack, a TIA, which is a mini stroke, but it can be, that can be an indicator of a more severe stroke coming along, okay? So a lot of times people have, you know, mini strokes and they come back 100%. And then it may have a, a major stroke, a CVA, you know, and it could be a lot worse. Or the first stroke could be a CVA. Like I told you guys, my mom passed away from a stroke. So a mini stroke, a trans ischemic um, attack, that happens about 80% of the time. No, I'm sorry, about 70% of the time. A hemorrhagic stroke, which is a wor the worst kind of stroke, only happens about 30% of the time. The mortality rate is a lot higher for a hemorrhagic stroke versus a trans ischemic, a TIA stroke. Or a mini stroke. Okay. Uh, signs and symptoms include, guys, possible severe headaches, numbness, confusion, difficulty hearing, dizziness, ataxia, and loss of consciousness. Consciousness. We're good on what ataxia means, right? It means we're, you, that's in your terms. But mm -hmm. uh, loss of loss of function or loss of muscle function to that area, to a certain area, the body part. So you just, you know, think about somebody who has a stroke, how they may have deficits where they can't move their arm or something like Anybody here know somebody with a stroke or post-stroke? You know, you maybe you won't be able to move your arm. You maybe have difficult walking. You may have to relearn, go to rehab, and learn how to do these things over again. Okay, that's a contributing factor in tax. My mom here. One. Okay. And that's just the brain right there, guys. So we're good. Cerebrovascular accident, stroke, TIA, Know what TI, know what transient means, temporary, ischemic, loss of blood. Transient mm ischemic. -hmm. Know, know what those words mean. Okay. We're good on strokes, guys? Good on strokes. Okay, so, guys, real quick. <laughs> this right here is the acronym um, for noticing a stroke right here. Guys, we have a sticker right here. If you look on the refrigerator on the side, it's a fat sticker right there. Usually in all our Harris Health elevators, they're going to have this fat, a glass placard in the elevator. Okay, so do know what the the fat, the, um, the acronym means. Fast. I mean, F meaning face drooping. These are some, these are signs you're looking for. You know, if you happen to somebody suspected of having a stroke. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you look for that face drooping on one side. Usually it's a unilateral, mm -hmm. unilateral thing. So you'll see, you know, maybe the one side of their face will look lazy or just drooping, real relaxed, okay? Meaning that's a, they can't, it's ataxia, they can in, involuntary muscle control, okay? All right, so uh, next thing you'll notice, A is for arm weakness, you know? Um, the person uh, tends to have some, maybe some tingling in their arms or they can't move their arm as well, okay? 
The S stands for speech difficulty. Of course, they might have slurred speech. I'll ever talk to somebody with a stroke, it's really tough to, to, to communicate with them and understand what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. And the T is for time to call ambulance. Guys, if you notice any one of these, these um, manifestations, definitely make sure you uh, call the ambulance ASAP. You notice one or more of those things. If clinical symptoms occur, immediately end the procedure and call for emergency assistance, guys. Again, don't never leave a patient alone, mm -hmm. but definitely make sure you have a way to call for emergency assistance, even though you gotta yell out, okay? So just know what our FAST acronym, acronym stand for, okay? Face drooping, uh, arm weakness, speech difficulty, and time to call ambulance. So, I think it's the last disease right here, guys. Diabetic emergencies. Um, diabetes mellitus is a metabolic disorder characterized by hyperglycemia, a lot of sugar in the blood that results from either an insufficient production of insulin by the pancreas, type A, or inadequate utilization of insulin by the cells in the body, type B. Okay. Um, it can produce clinical symptoms including, guys, we know what poly means, right? Many or you know, excessive, or in this case, polyuria. Anybody? Excessive urination, urine. meaning um, maybe producing a lot of urine, going to the restroom a lot. Okay, that's a that's a. I, I actually got that because that's a reason for a lot of exams we do. Polyuria, a lot of renal exams we do is for that reason. You know, or if you get a guy that um, that has polyuria, we're probably especially an older guy, we're probably thinking of an enlarged prostate, right? You got to go to the restroom a lot when you're older. Your prostate is probably enlarged, squeezing on your your uh, urethra and making you have to go to the restroom a lot. Okay. Polydipsia, guys, is excessive thirst. Okay. And polyphagia is excessive hunger. Okay. Um, this chronic disorder gradually damages small blood vessels and many organs, especially the liver and the kidneys. See our good liver right there and our sick liver? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Too much alcohol probably. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, our good kidneys and our bad kidneys. So it can really mess up, you know, um, your health over time. Health over time, okay? Diabetic emergencies, okay? So real quick, I want to, to because your book has a typo in it, right? So I want to clear that up real quick. When we're talking about phagia versus phasia. Okay, so we just learned that polyphasia means excessive hunger, right? But your book also has uh, has a term that says dysphagia, but it has the inco incorrect spelling, right? Okay. If you guys, uh, you can just look on page three hundred three in your terms. Difficult to spell. So it says dysphagia with an S is uh, difficult swallow. When actually dysphagia with phasia with an S actually referring to speech. Okay. Phasia with a with a G, that's either eating or swallowing. Okay? So dysphagia in the book, they kind of labeled it wrong. Okay? So no, just I got to take a picture of this, do what you gotta do, because I want you guys because that's gonna come back up. I guarantee that's gonna be on your one of your exams, you know, maybe in your admin in your OB class. This phasia versus phasia. Okay. Phasia with the G, we're talking about eating or swallowing. Phasia with the S, we're talking about speech. Okay? I just want you guys to know that difference and I want to clear that up in the book because the book did have a uh, this spelled wrong, it have an S in it. It should be a G. It should be a G. Alright. Alright. So back to di uh, diabetes. There are three types of diabetes, guys. Uh, type one insulin dependent and usually diagnosed before the age of 30. Um, type two, which is the most common form of diabetes, um, have a gradual onset and usually occurs in people over 40 years of age. Okay, and type three is gestational diabetes, when that happens to be diabetes that occurs in women while they're pregnant. Okay, and right here you can see I don't know how well you guys can see this chart right here, but 77% is type 2 diabetes. It's the most common form of diabetes, okay? And um, that's what I want you guys to know, that type 2 is the most common form of diabetes right there, okay? Um, so again, 
type one to me just try to explain insulin dependent, meaning that my pancreas isn't producing in, uh, insulin the way it should be. Yeah. So that's type one diabetes. My 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 pancreas isn't producing insulin the way it should be. Okay. Type two, meaning that yeah, my pancreas producing insulin, but the res the receptors in the blood aren't receiving the insulin. Okay. So that's why you stay in that hyperglycemic state. That too much sugar in the blood, so the insulin is gonna take that sugar and use it to make energy, right? Correct? Mm -hmm. Which I talked about the pancreas last week. So uh, some complications of diabetic of being diabetic include hypoglycemia, of course, we know that means not enough sugar in the blood, right? Diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, non-ketotic syndrome, and a coma. Um, in order to prevent a diabetic emergency, guys, that's why it's so important. We schedule our diabetic patients first thing in the morning mm -hmm. because they're not used to being NPO. Okay? And an in inadequate food intake can lead to high levels of insulin and thus be more prone to rapid onset complications. All right? Anybody know any diabetics personally want to add to that? Want to add to that? Any of those personally? Why? I have a sister, she had it. She can't fast in the fast every month. She cannot even do the fasting anymore. Definitely can. I'm sure she can. Yeah, it's I'm for sure all days. That's a long time. A lot of sugar in the blood. Okay. So when you have hypoglycemia, <coughs> you're not 